research it's associate, it's associate it's professor at uh, the social science division. Thank you. Mm, thank you all for coming on a gloomy Monday morning. Um, this paper that I'm presenting here today is actually based on a forthcoming article I have at the General Development Studies. Uh, but I am doing follow-up work on these issues, which is why I'd be very interested to hear your comments and questions. So, basically, uh, the title of the paper is, is the PDA is already a cash transfer. So I thought I'd first walk you through. Uh, there's been a long-running debate in India about uh, the PDS versus cash transfers, which sort of sets the background for the paper. Um, and for those of you who are unfamiliar with India, the PDS is the public distribution system. It sells subsidized cereals, uh, especially rice and wheat, uh, to poor households. And uh, uh, originally, it was a universal system. And from 1997 onwards, the subsidies have been explicitly targeted at the poor. And households are therefore classified as uh, antyodhya, which is sort of the poorest of the poor, below poverty line or above poverty line. And um, so uh, ostensibly, uh, the AAY and the BPL households should get the maximum subsidies, and the above poverty line households pay market prices or economic prices for the grain. Uh, however, the targeting is very problematic. And uh, several studies have shown there are large inclusion and exclusion errors. So uh, many poor households don't have BPL or AAY cards. And conversely, there are rich households which have these cards. Uh, apart from the targeting problems, the PDS also has problems of corruption and inefficiency on a staggering scale. Uh, so the estimates are 55% of the grain may be illegally diverted. This is basically stolen and then sold on the open market. Uh, the Indian Planning Commission, which is a government body, itself published an estimate of 70% uh, wastage due to corruption and inefficiency. And uh, another estimate is that so with all the errors targeting corruption and inefficiency, only about 10% of the total subsidy actually reaches the poor. Of course, this, uh, you know, this, once this kind of information becomes public, there, uh, there's been a huge outcry and a lot of people saying that uh, it's time we scrap the PDS and it would be much more efficient if the government simply gave these families cash, they would get a lot more of the subsidy. Uh, and there have been several critics. There's been an ongoing debate about this. On the other side, there are those who argue, uh, the famous ones being John Dres and uh, Ritika Khera, that the PDS can be successfully reformed. So they have studies showing the performance is patchy. So different states perform differently and especially the southern states do well. So uh, they're saying it's just a question of political will. You can reform it if you have the political will. And uh, they, the, there are also studies from this particular state, Chhattisgarh state, showing that uh, when the government actually made a significant effort to uh, enforce and to crack down on the corruption, they were able to uh, increase allocations and make sure that 90% of the grain was actually reaching and so on. So the first issue is, of course, what is more efficient, giving them subsidies in cash or using the PDS. The second issue the debate <coughs> centers around is the misuse of cash. 
So uh, those who are saying cash transfers, unconditional cash transfers are fine, uh, are arguing that there is not a very large potential for wasteful spending or misuse. And uh, several of them are actually advocating give the cash to the women or give it to the mothers. And uh, this again goes back to general development literature showing that women tend to spend more of the money under their control for the benefit of the household. On the other hand, uh, the supporters of the PDS actually point out, based on surveys, that the women are strongly against the shift uh, to money transfers. So the Ghosh 2011 article has a survey in a Delhi slum showing that 99% of the women preferred to receive food rather than cash because they said that cash may end up being spent on uh, other immediate needs or even on celebrations or alcohol. And uh, uh, they've also pointed out that in some areas the markets are remote, the banks are also remote, so uh, de facto the men may be the ones getting the cash transfer because women don't often travel out of the villages, and also going to the market. So if it's cash, the men will gain control uh, somehow or there's, there's a high probability of that. Um, and uh, there has actually been an activist campaign led by NGOs uh, called the Right to Food Campaign. They're generally concerned about malnutrition in India and uh, are strongly against the shift to cash transfers <laughs> and have been lobbying for both the continuation and actually the expansion of the PDS uh, to include not just rice and wheat, but uh, protein-rich things like pulses and cooking oil even. So they, they wanted to expand. Now, my paper actually uses national data, national sample survey data, that's the NSS, uh, over a period of 11 years. Uh, so I've used three rounds of the NSS data. And my key findings are these. Uh, basically, poor households have treated all additional PDS subsidies as a cash transfer. They have not increased cereal consumption, in spite of the fact that the PDS actually gave them larger real quantities of grain and higher real subsidies. And uh, the final conclusion is also that neither the reform PDS or the switch to cash transfers is going to raise either cereal consumption or, more importantly, even total food expenditure in poor households. And once I go through the data, you will see why. Um, so before I, I show you the actual data, a little bit of background uh, about uh, the theory of food subsidies and also the history of cereal consumption in India. Um, why uh, do we at all want to do food rations or food subsidies for poor families? Basically, governments have always felt that cash is fungible and cash can be spent on goods and services other than food. So government preferences have traditionally been to give poor families food stamps or food rations. And the US has had a long history of food stamps. Uh, programs. However, uh, economic theory uh, back in the 1940s pointed out that if the quantity of food you give these families or the value of the food stamps is less than is inframarginal, that is it is less than their planned consumption of food, they can simply reduce their market purchases of food to offset government transfers. Okay, so if they were consuming, say, 40 kgs of rice, or that was their planned market consumption, the government gives them uh, 10 kgs, they can, instead of now buying 40 kgs from the free market, they just buy 30 kgs and treat uh, the rest as a cash transfer, the money they save on that 10 kgs. So, of course, economic theory predicts that if these transfers are inframarginal, it doesn't matter whether you give the family food or cash, the total spending will be the same irrespective on food. Okay? So, and this was pointed out in 1945 by Southworth. 
So whether you give them food stamps or food rations or cash. However, the empirical data is actually different. So the history of US food stamps uh, has shown, several studies have shown that households actually tend to consume more food out of food stamps than out of increases in cash income, even when these food stamps, the provision is inframarginal for roughly 85 to 95% of the households. And this has been called the cash out puzzle in the US <coughs> of why didn't they cash out? Why, you know, why are they actually using it all to buy food? So for the PDS, which is a food subsidy, it can be seen as a form of in-kind food assistance because they have to buy the food to actually get the subsidy. And therefore, the economic theory prediction is that it will, the PDS will create both substitution and income effects, the standard uh, effects on consumer behavior. If the PDS provided extra marginal quantities of grain, that's quantities of grain higher than what the family actually planned to consume. And otherwise, if the quantity is inframarginal, it will only create income effects is the standard income effect in economics. If your income goes up, you are likely to increase spending on the, ent on the entire basket of goods that you normally consume, assuming they're all normal goods. And of course, from the empirical studies, you see that even if the PDS were inframarginal, there is a possibility that it would actually increase cereal consumption more than giving these families cash. So this is kind of the background of the debate. There has been uh, some previous work on the impact of the PDS, not much. Um, so there was a study earlier on which uh, ran for just a two or three period after the targeting of the subsidy started, so 97 to 99, uh, but it didn't cover all Indian states and it only covered the rural poor. The conclusion, however, is similar to my paper that the PDS has had only a marginal uh, impact on the calorie intake of the poor. But the reason they're saying is that it gave them very small quantities of grain. It gave them insufficient grain. Uh, there's another more recent study by Swedberg in 2012, uh, but this is a bit flawed. Uh, it's a cross-sectional analysis using data from 2004 or 5. Uh, and comparing households with BPL AAY cards to other poor households, uh, unfortunately, as this data shows, both sets of households actually receive PDS subsidies. The targeting is imperfect, and you cannot, uh, therefore, run a cross-sectional comparison like this. Also, the data shows that the BPL AAY households tend to be poorer than even the normal poor households. Apart from the uh, PDS impact studies, there have been general studies in India showing uh, over long periods of time falling cereal consumption. And usually it's falling average consumption, but there's also been studies showing that poor households are decreasing cereal consumption uh, from the 1980s up until the mid 1990s. Uh, mostly the period they cover is before subsidies began being targeted to the poor. There is, however, one study which covers a period after the Deaton and Dress study of 2009, which is showing that in the poorest rural quartile from 1983 to 2004-05, cereal consumption actually decreased. However, none of these studies looks at how PDS grain provision to poor households changed during the period in which their cereal consumption fell. And it's of course possible that that could have been reversed by targeting the subsidies to the poor. The reasons that these studies give for a, a general trend of falling cereal consumption is uh, things like a reduction in physical labor because Transport uh, has become more mechanized, agriculture has become more mechanized, infrastructure has improved and so on. So people are actually doing less physical labor and uh, therefore they claim that that leads to lower calorie requirements and cereal consumption. 
there's also a presumption that there have been changes in tastes and preferences. Uh, the issue that most concerns my work is they've also suggested that there may have been a rise in the relative price of cereals or a fall in real incomes, and either of these which, uh, could offset any positive impact created by the PDS. So I control for these two factors in my study. Okay. So uh, moving on to the data, uh, as I said, I've used three NSS rounds, National Sample Survey rounds, 99-2000, uh, 2004-05, 2000, and 2009-10 and that covers an 11 year period and I'm basically looking at two broad questions has the PDS raised cereal consumption in poor households and is it likely to raise total food expenditure in poor households. Um, because of all the serious problems with the targeting I have not used the BPLAY classification at all to uh, check whether the PDS has had a positive impact I've used uh, because that has actually become a politicized issue. Uh, if, if your local politician likes you, uh, even if your family is rich, you can get hold of a BPL card which entitles you to subsidized grain at a highly subsidized rate, 50% in some cases. Uh, so, it, uh, so in many cases it's actually a political decision who should get the cards as opposed to being real means testing of uh, is this household really poor or not. Uh, however, with the NSS data, there's not this issue. It's, it's basically a ranking of households by income. So I've used the bottom four deciles uh, by income in both rural and uh, urban areas to show uh, as my definition of poor households. So poor households are the bottom four <coughs> day size, and I've shown each day size separately. Um, also, first off, the quantities of the grain that the PDS actually provides are inframarginal, uh, because of that previous discussion we talked about, and in no case does it exceed 27% of a household's total consumption in none of these day size. So uh, basically, the PDS should only have income effects. So the conditions for a rise in cereal consumption gen uh, initiated by the PDS, uh, I basically need to show four things. The PDS should actually have given these poor households larger quantities of subsidized grain and, of course, larger real transfers. So the transfer, the value of the real transfer depends on both the difference between market prices and the subsidy price and the quantity of grain that they get. Uh, and as controls, I also need to show two things, that the market price of cereals has not ri risen relative to prices generally. So I've used the food price index and general price index. And real incomes in these households have not fallen over the period I'm looking at because that would automatically counteract any income transfer that the PDS generated. And for those of you unfamiliar with Indian data, uh, these are some notes. So you see in all the tables a term called monthly per capita expenditure. So the NSS reports categorize households on this basis with MPCE being used as a proxy for income, real income throughout. Uh, I've used the standard price indices that are used for poor rural and urban households in India. So the CPIL for rural households, the consumer price index for agricultural laborers, and the CPIIW for urban households, and this is standard. Um, so, and for the cereals that they get from the PDS, I've only considered rice and wheat. In some states, they get uh, small amounts of other kinds of coarse grains. and uh, They get sugar, kerosene, other things from the PDS. So, in fact, my calculation would possibly underestimate the real transfer from the PDS to a certain extent. 
and also all of the prices that I've got are unit value. Uh, basically, the reports give you for the households a value in rupees and a quantity in kgs, say, of rice purchases. And if you divide by the, the value by the quantity, you're getting the average price paid by the household. So these are not market survey prices. There are not actually serial price indices uh, which go back uh, in India for the duration I'm looking at. So the uh, data split into rural and urban. And I'm uh, showing you the rural figures first. Um, this is a very uh, complex table. So I'm, I'm going to split it up into two separate tables to highlight. Uh, the issues. Basically, I've calculated uh, there is a quantity of rice and wheat they get from the PDS. There's four deciles. First of all, the first bottom 10%, the second decile 10 to 20, third decile 20 to 30, and fourth decile. All the tables are laid out this way. And uh, three different years, 99, 2000, 2004, 5, and 2009, 10. And I'm looking at the percentage changes over the 11 year, entire 11 year period, percentage change. These are exactly the same. It's just two, the bottom two deciles here and the third and fourth deciles in the bottoms of the tables. Um, I have calculated the nominal income transfer uh, from the PDS in rupees per capita per month. All the figures are monthly per capita expenditure and consumption per household. So to show you an easier table with less data and less crowded. Uh, so basically for rural households, uh, first off, look at the quantity of PDS rice and wheat purchases. Over the period, there's been increases of over 100% in all the four bottom day size. I've converted the nominal income transfer into two different real estimates. The first is uh, just in constant 99,000 rupees. And the second is if you take, divide the nominal income transfer by the market price of cereals, how many extra kgs of cereals could they have bought? So uh, it's a real transfer in market kgs of cereals. And if you look for rural for deciles, there are increases of over 200%. Can I have a clarification? Yes. So how do you calculate an income transfer exactly? It's the quantity that they purchase times. So for the first, I calculate the nominal income transfer. Which is so for example, for rice, it is uh, what is the difference between the market and the subsidy price or the PDS price of rice? Suppose it's five rupees. And then how many kgs of rice did this household get from the PDS? Suppose it's 10 kgs. Then the nominal income transfer is five by 10, which is 50 rupees. And the market price you also get from the household data? Yes, because the NSS reports give you separate data for uh, non-PDS and PDS purchases. And I've treated everything that's non-PDS as at market price. Okay. Um, so the nominal income transfers I've then converted into two different real estimates. One is constant rupees, 99,000, using the CPIAL for rural data. Uh, and then in market kgs of cereals. Uh, and as I was saying, there are over 200% increases for all four day sales, okay, in the rural areas, if you look over the 11 year period. So the PDS has delivered to these poor households in terms of giving them larger quantities of grain, larger real transfers. Has total cereal consumption gone up? No. The answer is no. Total cereal consumption in all four day size has fallen. So minus 1.8 percent, minus, cannot read that, 7.57, minus 9.85, and so on. OK? Marginal falls in this day size, what, minus 1.8. Uh, and nine point, almost 10 percent falls over here. So you call it consumption, sorry, but it's purchases, right? Yes, uh, assuming they're consuming what they purchase. Um, 
Uh, sorry. Yeah. That, so for, that's true for, is that a fair assumption for rural households? For all they're consuming what they're purchasing and not what they're producing. Even, so even the, what, uh, what they purchase, uh, so all of their consumption is, is uh, <coughs> added up. It may be homegrown, but it's still being uh, put in at factory gate kind of prices. So the right. cage, and so it doesn't affect the cages, even the prices at which you value them. It's kind of as a purchase, though. If I yes. Own. Yes. So it's total consumption of. Right. And the other the question grain. I have is the. I presume the PDS grain is not the same quality. Quali as yes. Market. So there is a quality issue, but even so, the uh, overall the studies have shown that households will buy as much grain as they can possibly get from the PDS. So it's uh, there is an uh, there are issues of poor quality versus what you would buy from the market. But they are still trying to buy uh, as much as possible from the PDS. Can I just ask one more question? Yes. Yeah, I'm wondering if there's a secondary market for that grain. Like the PDS grain? Yeah, in the US, there's a secondary market for food stamps. Too. OK. Um, mm, because the quantities are intra marginal, mm -hmm. probably not. Uh, and this, the secondary market in this case actually is arising from the government agents that are actually supposed to be selling the grain to these consumers illegally. Uh, so the diversion that 55% of the grain doesn't reach uh, is that they are actually stealing that grain and then selling it on the open market. So th that's how the secondary market is actually happening from so, and then the control conditions for rural areas, their incomes, uh, if their incomes had fallen off, the relative price of cereals had gone up over the period, you would then expect, okay, that explains some of the fall in cereal consumption, but no. So, uh, I, the, I've created the index of the market price of cereals, and again, a reasonable control. So, it's gone up by around 60%, 60 to 62% in all four of the bottom missiles. The general price index and the food price index both went up by 72% over the period. So cereal prices have actually fallen relatively over the period. And real MPCE, which we are using as a proxy for income, has gone up in all four missiles. So gone up by 8.7%, 9.73%, roughly 8 to 10% in the four bottom deciles in rural areas. So I have another question about how you're defining deciles over time. So hmm. if, you, if your expenditure grows, do you move between the deciles here? And also the, the program is going to affect your expenditure. So uh, you're looking at effects broken down by expenditure groups, but which group you're in may also be affected by whether you're getting these the uh, subsidies or not. So then it gets a little bit hard to... No, the, it's true that the composition is changing over time. So those who were in the bottom decile in 99-2000 are not necessarily the same households that are there in 2009-10. So you may have moved between deciles. So that, that is possible, though there, there is not that much upward mobility that you would actually to have transcended four deciles, say. Or, but, uh, even so, the fact uh, that they have larger incomes and that uh, cereal prices actually fell relatively uh, would indicate you can't use a strictly revealed preference argument because the composition has changed and the basket of goods is also different. So, uh, but you, what you can say is that uh, these households could definitely afford to buy more cereals, and they didn't the ones in the bottom day side. And of course, real income has gone up, so they are richer. So it's, uh, in that sense, in the theoretical sense, you can't use a strictly uh, revealed preference kind of uh, argument. All right, so uh, this is the urban data. And here, I'll just show you the two uh, simpler tables. Again, uh, quantity of PDS rice and wheat has gone up, not quite as much as in the rural areas, but still ranging from about six, uh, well, 30% to uh, 
to 128% in the lowest decile. So they have definitely got more green. Have they got larger real income transfers? Yes. Again, not quite as large uh, an increase as in the rural areas, but going from 135% to 235-270% increases. So sizable increases. And again, if you look at total cereal consumption in kgs from all sources, it has fallen in every single day side. So minus 3.73, 6.78, and so on, and steepest fall here, minus 11%. And the control for the urban areas, uh, market price of cereals went up by about 65%. 75% and so on, but the general price index and the food price index went up by much more, by 80 and 85%. So again, cereal prices have fallen relatively. And finally, real MPCE, so real incomes have gone up by between 5 and 12%, 6 and 12% actually, 5.74. So clear increases in income over the period. So this kind of indicates that poor families have not used these higher PDS subsidies, the higher real transfers over the period, to raise cereal consumption. They've used it as cash to buy other goods and services. So the PDS is functioning exactly like a cash transfer. And of course, even a cash transfer should have raised cereal consumption because of income effects. And cereal consumption has fallen. So then, of course, the debate about uh, the PDS and cash transfers becomes meaningless. If your goal is to increase cereal consumption, neither reforming the PDS nor switching to cash transfers is therefore going to increase cereal consumption. You have already lowered the market price of cereals. These households already have larger incomes and larger transfers. And they did not choose to increase cereal consumption. And since the PDS is already being treated like a cash transfer, switching to cash transfers is not going to make any difference. So of course, uh, yeah, you know, it might be argued that cereals are just one part of the diet. And nutrition depends on not just how much rice and wheat they're eating, but also uh, the, you know, meat, milk, fruit, vegetables, all the other food groups, and so on. So then it becomes meaningful to see is the PDS improving nutrition by increasing spending on foods other than cereals? So are they buying other food with it? And has, uh, if the PDS is acting like a cash transfer as a policymaker, what you really want to know then is what percentage of income increases are being spent on food? And that's what uh, the, the next set of data is looking at. So has total food expenditure gone up? Um, at this point, uh, you know, it has been argued, like I showed earlier, that cereal consumption is falling because tastes have changed. Uh, however, um, the, the food expenditure issue, uh, they overall, they need to consume some amount of food. And tastes and preferences are subjective. The objective indicators of malnutrition in India are not good at all, even with high growth. Uh, so this quote I've used, anthropometric indicators of nutrition in India for both adults and children are among the worst in the world. For women, in some cases, they are comparable to sub-Saharan Africa. And uh, the same study says 50% of Indian children are underweight and roughly 50% are anemic. So uh, while you can say that tastes and preferences have changed, uh, as a policy maker, the issue of malnutrition is still very high, or, should, or at least should be very high, on the agenda given the objective indicators for this. And so the question I was looking at is, has total food expenditure risen with PDS subsidies and high real incomes? And the short answer to that question is no. In 75% of poor households, real food expenditure actually fell over this 11-year period. And that's the data I'm showing you next. 
Uh, again, I'm showing it for both rural and urban uh, poor households separately, bottom four day size. And uh, so I'll just switch to the shorter table, uh, which highlights uh, this. Again, rural poor households, real, real so total expenditure, real NPC went up by 8% to 10% roughly in the bottom four day size. So, and real food expenditure has gone down in this day size, marginally, a marginal rise over here, a slightly larger rise over here, and again, a marginal fall over here. And on the other hand, if you look at real non-food expenditure, it's gone up by a much larger percentage. So 8.7% total expenditure increase, food expenditure falling by 0.2%, but non-food expenditure going up by 27%. Uh, same things here, non-food expenditure in all decades has gone up by roughly 27% over the period, with food increasing only marginally in these two. So even in these two deciles, the, the, any increase in income has largely been devoted to non-food expenditure as compared to food. Um, in urban areas, the, it is even more striking, and uh, I'm showing you the data, the short table for urban areas, Again, real, uh, real incomes have gone up by around 5 to 12 percent in the bottom four day size, and food expenditure has fallen in all four day size, and larger falls than in rural areas, so 6.5 percent, 4.9 percent, and so on. And finally, again, if you look at real non-food expenditure, that's gone up by a lot more. 22, 27, 30%, and 30% rises in non-food expenditure. So it's very clear where increases in income, and that includes, of course, increases in PDS transfers, are going uh, with these households. What, what, are, what components of non-food expenditures are growing? Um, you know? Yeah, um, well, uh, different things, so including mobile phones and things that didn't exist in, say, 1999-2000 or didn't exist to that extent. Uh, but there have been increases in even education, uh, entertainment, so it's a mix. Uh, there is, so the education, health and medical has gone up also, but on the other hand, entertainment's also gone up. So it's uh, it's a mix to that. There's also a question in the NSS about whether you can afford two square meals a day, right? Isn't there a question on that? Possibly. I didn't see the data on that, though. Okay, because I was yeah. wondering if, you know, we're, you're looking at expenditure of calorie intake or soy so, but hmm. I'm wondering what the answer to that question. Um, I think over the years, the number, the percentage of households saying that they did not, could not afford uh, the three square meals a day has gone down. So that's what the last 2009-10 report kind of said. There's an overall summary at the beginning. So they're not saying that they can't afford two square meals or three square meals. So mm -hmm. fewer of them are saying that they cannot. Yeah, so fewer of them are saying they cannot over the years. Uh, I'm a little bit confused about the logic of the argument because there's obviously something major going on in consumption structure mm. in India. Uh, and so just because, you know, PDS has increased and cereal or food consumption has not increased, it doesn't mean that PDS is not having a positive effect on food consumption and cereal consumption relative to the case if there had not been any PDS. Because obviously these things are going down mm. by themselves. So I had expected a comparison of the households receiving PDS and mm. households maybe not receiving PS mm. as additional type of a comparison because how do we know these are not all be driven by just... The, so you're the saying it, yeah. serial consumption would have fallen even more if there yeah, had been no yeah. PDS. Yeah, how do we... That is, I mean, that is the counterfactual. 
Uh, on the other hand, you could also say that uh, they would cut back. So there is one study showing that cereal consumption per se may be somewhat inelastic, income inelastic. Uh, so that there's not a huge variation in the 10 day sales. It, 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 so if you just look at rural and urban data separately, there's not a huge amount of variation in the 10 day sales. So it may be relatively income inelastic, which might also uh, suggest that if the PDS had cut back or the PDS had been phased out, they might cut back on non-food expenditure and to maintain cereal consumption at this level. So, but the counterfactual, it's true that unless you have much more data on the actual consumption patterns, as you're saying, exactly how is it shifting, it's not possible to answer that question satisfactorily. Okay, um, so basically for the urban households, same situation, uh, real MPC going up, real non-food expenditure going up by large percentages, 30% even, and real food expenditure falling, um, which uh, again argues for so uh, that is uh, the data. This then brings up the question which I began with, uh, the PDS versus food uh, ca cash transfers debate is basically arguing about whether the PDS should be reformed, scrapped, whether India should just shift to cash transfers. And of course, the answers depend on what are the objectives of the PDS. And those have, because the PDS evolved over so many years from the 1960s to the 2000s, and several different governments having input and redesigning the programs, there's not been a very clear uh, idea of what exactly are they expecting it to do. Uh, however, if you read uh, the Planning Commission documents and so on, it seems they're, they're, the PDS is expected to perform, or has been expected to perform three major roles. The first is in the initial years when it was actually set up in the 1960s, and markets in India were s small and fragmented and so on. Uh, it was expected to counteract hoarding and act as a check on market forces so uh, as both a price stabilizing and a distribution mechanism for food grains in remoter areas. Now, as India has developed, the distribution system is a lot better now. So arguing that the PDS is needed for that is, uh, especially in urban areas, it's, it's unlikely that there are well-functioning markets which are providing rice and meat. However, some of the supporters of PDS say that in really remote rural areas, there is no other shop selling rice and wheat uh, within a, a significant radius around the village. So if the PDS stopped, the villagers would have to travel miles to go and buy basic food. Uh, so in those cases, of course, it's still needed for that. On the price stabilization front, actually, it seems to be counterproductive uh, because the studies have shown that uh, the government is procuring much more than it offloads to the PDS. So the government has been building up huge stocks of rice and wheat, which have then been rotting in godowns because they don't have the Food Corporation of India doesn't have proper storage facilities. At the same time, this procurement by the government uh, and releasing less than what is procured up to an order of 12 million tons per year is overall raising market prices for cereals. And my data right beginning shows that no how, no, none of the households in the bottom day size is getting more than 27% of their total cereals from the PDS, which means the market is where they get the majority of their cereals from. So that by raising market prices, the government is actually hurting the poorest Indian households, even the poorest. Everybody's suffering, but even the poorest don't get a majority of their grain from the PDS. So market prices matter. And if government uh, policy measures raise market prices, you're therefore hurting the poor. But, but what's happening on the supply side? I mean, is the government buying these grains and there's minimum prices. support prices so there's a whole agricultural purchase policy in place 
uh, to support farmers initially, that was the idea. Yes? I guess there's also the broader issue of the 55% of the grain that's diverted. <laughs> the target population, I mean, I mean, that seems to be the really massive. Yeah, that arouses the largest amount of public anger and outrage. Right. Of so I guess, you know, right. what, what efforts are being made to, to try to crack down on that? So, uh, like I said, I mean, some states are better than others. So it is, uh, it, it does seem to be an issue of political will. So the, the state, the model state that they talked about uh, has actually started sending, um, so they mark, they paint the trucks, the PDS trucks in bright colors or identifiable colors. They send SMSs to, uh, to the villages, text messages to the villages saying, this truck left this point this truck is carrying so much grain, so much grain should reach the village and so on. So, so apparently... What are the best performing states that you said in the South? Um, so it would be Kerala, Tamil Nadu. Um, and, but that's been traditional and those states perform well on a range of development indicators. This new state, Chhattisgarh, has actually been very successful with trying to clamp down on the corruption in the PDS. So that that's the uh, thing for that. So uh, the other objective of the PDA is providing a safety net. Uh, if the idea is just to give a handout, then of course cash transfers, uh, as the current government is, uh, seems to be determined to shift to cash transfers and has already set up over a million bank accounts for households that previously didn't have a bank account. Um, and uh, will perhaps implement uh, sh a shift from the PDS to cash transfers. They've already done it for other subsidies. Um, how, even here, there are, uh, you know, the critics say, just like grain can be diverted, it may be equally, it may in fact be easier to divert cash transfers when you have an illiterate population, uh, unfamiliar with banking, and so on, where it could be quite easy to trick them out of their money. Oh, uh, so there is a debate around even whether the electronic cash transfers, uh, how effective that would be. Uh, this, uh, my main argument is around the third objective, that if the goal is to increase food consumption or improve nutrition for families, this is not working. The PDS is not working and even the shift to cash transfers, uh, judging by what they do with increases in income, is unlikely to improve nutrition. So uh, devoting resources to reforming the PDS uh, again becomes a questionable uh, way to go if the, if the goal is new, better nutrition and that they, you may need to explore other options. Yes? With respect to this last point, mm -hmm. uh, you, know, you made the argument earlier that people worry that women might use the food for their, for their households, are more likely to use transfers for, their, for the good of their households. So mm -hmm. if you don't have the counterfactual on what would the decrease in nutrition have been if they had hadn't had, had the PDS. Right. So then how do we know that changing it from PDS to cash transfers will not reduce, let's say, nutrition even more. Mm, so, uh, yeah, with the current PDS, women still need to have some cash. So uh, that's actually another point I've addressed in the paper. Uh, suppose the subsidies are, say, 50% of the price. So they still need to have the balance 50% in cash, the women, to be able to buy PDS grains. So to get the full subsidy from the PDS, you need to have at least that amount of cash. So in fact, it would make sense for the government to start giving free food. So instead of giving the family 20 kgs at a 50% subsidy, uh, you give them 10 kgs free. And that so all of the logistical operations then of the trucking, because the grain is being stolen at various points along the entire route, uh, by cutting down on the amount of grain that is being transported and so on, you can cut down on the 
corruption and inefficiency. And also this, if you make women the beneficiaries for the free food, then they need to have zero cash or they need to control zero cash. So in really dysfunctional families, say where the husband is drinking away any available cash on alcohol, the woman can still get free, uh, get that whatever minimum basic entitlement without having any cash and so on. So for a security uh, net, uh, a safety net, uh, you may just, uh, you may want to move over to free food because it's, it's being treated, uh, you know, they are making, the Indian consumer is homo economicus and is doing it the way the economic textbooks would say, is treating it like a cash transfer, of course, without uh, income tax. So are you taking a position on cash transfers in the end versus BDS? I mean, I couldn't tell even, um, you know, you're just... Uh, I'm saying I, no, in you're not saying, uh, no. I'm saying unconditional cash transfers are not going to work because that's like an increase in income. And an increase in income is being devoted overwhelmingly to non Okay, but expense. under the current PDS, it'd be at, as, at least as good. It would be no worse. You're saying, why not try to fix a targeted scheme to have a nutrition effect? So you're arguing for something that doesn't exist. Yes, so I'd say, suggest, mm, mm, I'm not in favor of the PDS or cash transfers. So I'd say if, if nutrition is the goal, then the government needs to focus on, say, maybe better school feeding programs, which they already have, they have. And, but very poor implementation, right. so better to focus on that. But why, why, why should we pursue this nutrition goal through either PDS or cash transfer when we have a school lunch program that's you know, it's a much better record of success, at least for kids. And, I mean, in respect to PDS and cash, it seems like the big costs of PDS are not about whether it's meeting these goals. It's just this is huge efficiency loss. I mean, corruption is just a transfer, but there's also huge... To run a public distribution system means the government has to be involved in the supply side of agriculture, yes. in the storage of uh, these uh, goods, in the in the transport, and it's it, it involved in this whole chain, which has introduces huge distortions to both the supply side and the demand side. Yes, I and, couldn't and agree. In the pro <laughs> and, and these governments have no incentive to be efficient at this process. Yes. In, in China, that was the big cost of the grain system. I think was was this this huge huge inefficiencies that led to huge debt and loss making by grain uh, peristale companies. Uh, that were a huge sink on the economy, and all of the distorting effect on the production side, which led to all sorts of inefficient incentives for farmers. And China basically went from PDS to cash, mm -hmm. and and now they just fo they try to integrate a lot of the subsidy programs into one subsidy cash subsidy program for poorer households, mm -hmm. which to me seems extremely sensible uh, in, in yes, balancing what you think you, what you can actually do in these types of programs uh, versus the distortion costs, which you haven't really emphasized in, in the whole market. No, I, I agree. So the distortion costs are huge, and uh, I, I don't think the PDS should be continued, or uh, I don't think it's worth devoting government resources to reforming it. However, if they insist on keeping it, they could at least make it less uh, inefficient by switching to free food. But, so yes. All right. Other questions? Any other questions? I think I've just done my time. All right. Thank you very much.